Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, aka The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. I'm so excited to speak today with Pam and Dr. Corey Allen. And it's kind of it's interesting to me why I'm so excited. One is that while I know very little about your biographies, or even the details of Corey's training, I know that we have an extremely similar perspective and it's rare for that to happen. And when it does, it always catches my attention and it invariably leaves me that much more enthusiastic and more clear about the things that I believe and teach to hear someone come to such similar conclusions through a completely different doorway of life. So. That's the opening context, and I want to give a very warm welcome to both of you. Pam, will you share what you'd like people to know about you? Wow, that one caught me off guard. That's a pretty simple question, caught me off guard. Um, (laughs) I would say um, that I love doing life with this man sitting next to me, with Corey, Um, and that I guess my, my goal would be to just help make the world a better place somehow, whether it be through what we do with Sexy Marriage Radio or my kids or what I do with work. Just try and leave it a better place. So simple and profound. Mm -hmm. May we all have that goal, honestly. Okay, (laughs) Dr. Corey, what would you like people to know about you? Uh, That would be the idea that marriage uh, produces better people. And that's what we try to work towards is help frame conversations so that you can grow up, experience more excitement, vibrancy, aliveness, if you will, and impact everybody that you come in contact with. Because this is a legacy thing in our mind that Mm -hmm. we love being a part of 100 year legacies is what we talk about it. Because if you can change and impact a marriage, they'll have kids who will end up getting married, who have kids who end up getting married and have kids. And if you can start with one, it'll spread out to a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. And let's dive in there. First, just saying that the two of you have been married for 29 and a half years. That is a celebration on its own. Mm -hmm. And you're the host of Sexy Marriage Radio, which how long have you been doing that? I know, Pam, you joined more recently, but how long has Sexy Marriage Radio been going? So it's it's been on the air for over 11 years. She's been the full-time co-host with me for almost four. How did you know to start this 11 years ago? And also, I really love the title, Sexy Marriage Radio, because, well, for one thing, it's honest. But for another, I have the impression that you speak to a relatively conservative audience, and yet sexy marriage radio it is. So it's kind of like you're dancing a bunch of different dances all at once. How did that unfold? How did you know to be ahead of the curve 11 years ago? Well, it's, it started, I mean, the short story of it is it started with, I was writing for a local newspaper that was uh, two little suburbs North of where we live. And as I was writing weekly articles for family and marriage, um, I started posting them online, which that started getting a little bit of feedback and comments. And I was like, this is a whole lot more fun than newspaper writing. So 
started really divide, diving into to blogging and figuring out how to build a blog. So built one in a couple of years, um, just figured out the ins and outs, got a readership. And then anytime I wrote on the topic of sex, that was one of the most commented and well-received because largely it was not being spoken about in an honest, straightforward, non-crass, non-crude way. And so then it just became, I stumbled across the idea of podcasting, I guess. I don't even remember how, but it was became, a, I'd love to do a podcast and learn how to do that. And so I didn't want to just be a guy talking about sex solo. That mm-hmm. that can be fun, but it's not near as fun as having sex with somebody else, uh, particularly your spouse. Talking about sex, right? Well, well let's go with both. The podcast. I think, the podcast. It's bo- I think it's both. Um, yeah. it's, fun, it's more fun having sex with you than it is by myself. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it's that idea of, we uh, just wanted to find somebody that helped talk about it. So we'd have a male and female representative. And at that point, Pam was not going to be on board with something like that. She was knee deep in the accounting world, uh, kids, just everything that was going on. And so I found a, a colleague that I'd come across a couple of years prior that she was in the blogging world, asked if she wanted to join me. She did. She was with me for two years, transitioned out, found another lady that was with me for four and a half years. And then she transitioned out and that's when Pam came in uh, for the full time since. Okay. That's so good. So I deeply agree with you, but I would love to hear how you speak about how I don't have the quote that, you know, exactly what you said in my mind, but basically having a great marriage makes you a better person. Mm -hmm. That's my way of putting it. If you want to, change it to be more accurate. Will you just flesh that out? It, it's obviously what you see. It's what I see, but like lift the curtain so people who who don't see it can. Yeah. So I, I believe just this is from my schooling. I came across the phrase that marriage is a people growing machine. Um, mm. that it's actually a mechanism that helps grow us up, that that's really, and I think biblically speaking, that's what it was designed to do. It's not for happily ever after. It's for being a better person and creating better character and wisdom as individuals. Because what better way to be thrown in the fire with somebody that you love and will drive you crazy? And because they don't think the same way, they don't see life the same way, and theirs is not wrong, yours is not right, nor vice versa. So I think there's if you can give it a different meaning to it, then all of a sudden now it starts to become what's being exposed in me, what's requiring of me in this, that it's not just, I need to change my spouse. And so we just believe in talking about the concept of sex within marriage, um, that it's, it's a language. And there's another phrase we use all the time that how you do sex is how you do life and how you do life is how you do sex. So, because we can't hide who we are in marriage, you can't hide who you are in sex that, if you're selfish in your in your life, you're going to be selfish in bed. That's just kind of the way it goes. That's a real simplistic. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. But it's just there's an idea of I think when you can help people understand there's something else going on that I'm not just unhappy or I'm not just not getting my way. It's actually an opportunity for me to grow and then use one of the phrases my wife likes to use a lot, which is the idea of what I want to be married to me. Mm-hmm. And- Say more about that, Pam. Will you will you put it in your words? Yeah, well, I grasped this. I actually heard that phrase from Corey, and I think you got it from somewhere else, mm-hmm. but but I'm taking it as my own because that was really the question I asked myself at a point that I realized my um, culpability and issues that we had in our marriage. I, for a long time, I thought Corey was the one that needed to change because he was doing this or he had done that. And one day I just, I, I realized no, I wouldn't want to be married to me. I understand why he did X, Y, Z because he didn't want to deal with ABC that would come for me. Uh, So I think that if all of us can really look at ourselves and how we are as a spouse, how we are as someone to live with and co-parent with and all those things that we do together, uh, unless I'm asking that question to myself and being real honest about it, then I might be shortchanging my relationship or short shortchanging myself and how I treat other people. So is that a question you still ask yourself on a regular basis? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, would I want to be married to me, but also would I want, what, I think about this, I, I, I rephrase it with my kids now and 
would I want to be in the same house as me as a mother? Mm. Right? Uh, so I'd, I'd try and would I want to be a friend to me? So I've kind of taken mm-hmm. it for all my relationships at this point. Um, but yeah, I still, I still ask myself. You know, Alexandra, you know, you and I, from our conversation, when you've been on the show, you and I both know from what you talk about, it's so much easier to talk about, well, they did this or they did that, or they won't do this or they won't. And that's the, that is the cause of all of my problems. So yeah. if they would therefore just change, my world would be great. And what happens actually, just from my experience in, in therapy, working with all kinds of people for two decades now, the times when somebody actually does really do a big change for the sake of somebody else, that's only short lived at best of actually producing something good and beneficial and joyful and gracious in the long run. Because you're still dealing with you all the way through, you know, like the common denominator of our stories is ourselves. Yeah. You know, I'm currently coaching a couple and I coach in a way that absolutely aligns with what you've, what you're saying. But I also find that some people understand that right away and others feel like it's not fair. Like, why do I have to do all the changing? Why do I have to change so much? It's not fair. He should have to change also, or she should have to change also. And honestly, I feel like that is not the right question to be asking at all. But how do the two of you think about that phenomenon? You want to share your mom's phrase about that? Well, okay. yeah. So the 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 <laughs> best phrase I've got with about the concept of fair came from my mother, actually, because she just offhandedly one day said when I was younger, well, the fair comes once a year and it sucks too. So <laughs> just deal with life in that sense. Uh, because it's just there is an imbalance in in life. Life is not fair at all. We don't live in a safe world overall. We like to think we do, but your spouse is after what they're after. So am I, right? Sometimes to the detriment of other people. Hopefully it's not majorly harmful, but there's still an element of, wait, there's impact of everything we do. And so, yeah, you could take the stance because when I hear that kind of a phraseology of, well, it's not fair. Why do I have to do all the changing? Well, that's not in, that's not coming from an empowered stance. That's still attached to this illusion of what equal or happiness or whatever would be rather than what if you actually grew yourself up and looked at your spouse square in the eye and say, you know what? I do more than my fair share in this marriage. If you still got a problem, then let's have it. What is it? But I'm good with what I'm doing and who I'm becoming. And that's a different delineation of the power between you. So then it lands on each person's shoulders better to have to deal with what's really the dynamic because there's a whole time of seasons. I mean, the best example we use is I'm married to a tax accountant. And so when she first got into tax season, we had a real clear understanding of the best way I support my wife during that time is take care of home and kids. When I can do all of that, she knows full well, it can eliminate some of mom guilt. It won't take care of all of it, but it can eliminate some, but it allows her to come in help out when she can and wants to, or is able, but otherwise come in, be here when you can be here. We'll come see you when we can see you and we'll figure it out. And then we'll make up for the time in the summer or over the Christmas break or something. You know, but it's just having that understanding. I could easily say, it's not fair. I got to carry all the weight during these months. And like, well, she's like, yeah, but we agreed through this. <laughs> this, this was a, this was a decision. We both said, I do. And that's what marriage is. It's always a volunteer sport. Mm-hmm. I love that. It's a volunteer sport. I have to say for me personally, it was really eye-opening to learn that basically the concept of fair is an expression of victim consciousness, that Mm -hmm. any sense like that's not fair comes from victimhood. It's not Mm -hmm. an empowered orientation. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, one question that I ask all of my guests is based on, I'm saying something very similar to what the two of you have said, but in my words, it's that personal relationships are the ultimate vehicle for personal growth. And so I'd love to ask you first, Pam, what have you learned about yourself as a result of being married to Corey? I think the biggest one was 
how hard I was to live with, that I had expectations that were just, well, I don't know, you know, it wasn't the expectation piece. I, I was, I was an angry person. He was scared to live with me. Re reactive would be a better way reactive. to say it. You weren't, you weren't like just always seething, but I think there was an element of there could be reactivity that was going on. I felt angry. Okay. Well, then <laughs> you were all, hey, thank <laughs> for the truth here, Alexandra. We're getting somewhere. Let's get <laughs> Blame shooting out my ears. Um, yeah, he, it, he was scared to be truthful with me because of how I would react. Um, so having that realization and it took a long time. I mean, what that was like 12 years in something mm -hmm. like that before that really came out. Uh, it, and that was, I don't know, kind of sad to think, wow, my, my own husband is kind of scared of me. What does that say about me? So that, but that was a great turning point too. I mean, it was a, it was a great realization for both of us to figure out for you to not be the nice guy through that for me to change how I react. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just pick up on, cause I'm assuming the same question might be coming my way too. So let's just, it is, it is. Go ahead. Uh, because one of the things that is interesting on how it's coupled up was if she's describing, um, what I want to be married to me, what I want to, with my reactions, that there's an element of some truth of, wow, there would be some scariness to the way I could overreact to things. But I also, what I uncovered in me is a, a fear of just living life boldly, a fear of being courageous about some things. I had a, a little bit of wallflower syndromes at times of, I didn't want to be seen or heard, even though I desperately wanted to be seen and heard. And so I would hide and avoid and, and so that's kind of like a perfect match <laughs> if you think about it to go down into the the depths of whatever despair might be if you just follow that all the way through. Yeah. But by realizing, because she referred to the nice guy, and that's just a phrase we use from Dr. Glover, of yes, yes. A manipulative covert contract kind of a person. That was me of the happy wife, happy life was what I believed. And that's such, that is such a falsehood. Um, and and so it's just when I realized, wait, I need to just, for lack of a better phrase, man up and be a, be who I want to be in life, like in, in, envelop all of my being and my character and live. And so doing that meant it was going to be disruptive to her, which also was like scary because anytime I did disappoint or didn't follow through with something spoken or not, it, there was a fallback. And so it was just, it, it made me have to face me just like she had to face her. And so it was kind of like chicken and the egg. I don't know which one actually came first. It was just both of us growing up. And, and honestly, the show helped starting a podcast and writing this. She, she was my editor on reading everything I wrote at the very beginning too. And so the dialogues we were having was kind of like our own personal therapy mm -hmm. uh, that was going on too, and personal development going on. I mean, you talk about, uh, personal growth happens in marriage. I think sometimes marriage is actually boot camp. Yes. At times if, too. if we are courageous enough to let it be. Right. And then it can even go into the Navy SEALs hell week component. It <laughs> really into some of the nitty gritty right. things of like, we've got to figure out how we navigate some of these things that are really a problem. If we don't, if we think of it as, well, it's over, we don't see eye to eye rather than wait, there's room for two people here. Cause mm -hmm. one of our beliefs is, an intimate marriage, stealing from your title of the show, yes. is an intimate marriage is where there's room for two people. And so I think that's important to, that we won't always see eye to eye. We won't always agree, but there's room for both of us. Yes. You know, the two of you are mature and coherent, and there's a lot of transmission in your words. I'm wondering if you would dial down to any specificity, especially if you have an example in sex, but if not, it's fine for where you've come up against shortcomings or differences in how you've navigated that. Do you have a, a specific example you'd share? Well, one that comes to my mind, this one we've talked about on the show before. So it's, it's public knowledge anyway, because we, we, you know, that's that never, that's that weird, needle to thread sometimes when you do a show on sex is there's still stuff that's ours. There's, there's <laughs> stuff we share 
about our life, but there's also still stuff in our life that's ours. But what comes to my mind was when Which, I started- Let growing, me just say, that's so important. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's still a private life going on. There's still, there's still our world. Um, yeah. But um, we, we went into marriage with the obligation sex marriage that it was, it was largely um, designed for me as the male, that that's the, what the world kind of believed and taught that that's, she was just there to exist for my needs and followed that through for a while. And it was ridiculously horrible looking back on it. Oh, great. And so as we started growing and I started realizing, wait, I, would I want to have sex with me? The answer to that question was no, I was selfish, right? I, why would I want to be all about one person? That's ridiculous. And so I had to start growing up. One of the best things I did for our marriage and our sex life was go to grad school. Um, <laughs> Cause Truly, that, that helped fun. with some of the courses I took was like, man, I'm learning a ton of things. Okay. So let's be very I, yeah. clear. Not just any grad school. There no. are many any grad, grad school. schools that are worse for Good sex point. life True. because you're busier, but you mean grad I went school to go, I went to go get training in marriage and family therapy. Okay. So okay. <laughs> I had to take anatomy and sexuality classes and different things. It was like, wow, I'm getting exposed to things I wasn't ever exposed to before. Yeah, so. so the thing that's generalizable here is that you got education on things you didn't know about before. And that is available to anyone, whether they go to a PhD program for psychology, or you pick up a really good book or listen to your podcast or mine. Absolutely. Go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. And so one of the things where it started rearing its head when it realized, wait, this, I want, we want a sex life because this is a conversation we'd kind of had. We want mm -hmm. a sex life where there's both of us involved, where good sex and great sex is de delineated by both people are seeking what they want for themselves and for each other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, so one of the times we're in the middle of sex, she's just kind of checked out. And normally I would have just followed the route. Like, oh, okay, whatever. I'm we're still having sex. It's fine. Let's go on. And and I stopped and was like, where are you? And she's, I'm just not here, which is a common thing, right? There's times where the body and the mind might make the decision of let's try this out. And then you just don't quite get there. And so the problem is too, too often we would just hope one of us would go blind with that and just keep going and act like I didn't have that information. But in the, instead, that time I'm like, okay, well, I don't want it like this. I'll and wait. then what happened? I, 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 I'll wait. And I got up and I left the bed and I walked to the bathroom and it was the longest walk I've ever had because I basically had just drawn a line in the sand saying, I want you to show up and I'll wait till you do. And I don't know how long that's going to be. And it, And it's not like he stormed off. No. No, no, I don't hear it that way. But the thing that is so interesting to me is that basically when there's that kind of honesty, and in this case, Pam, you were checked out, then there's essentially just taking your hands off the wheel and waiting, which is what you did, Corey. And there are plenty of men, especially if they've been happy wife, happy life, uh, Mr. Nice Guy types, that would feel compelled to touch in such a way that would invite you back, Pam. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's ultimately the more empowered move to just gently walk away so that in this scenario, a woman needs to take responsibility and show up. But in the moment, that can feel like a rejection and it can feel like you might wish, or I'll say I might wish to have the touch change to help me back into the present moment. How did you think about that? Or how do you think about it now, Pam? It was kind of a relief of n not him walking away so that we didn't have sex. Not that. It was a relief to have him standing up for what he wanted, number one. Number two, to know it was a statement to say, this isn't just about me. I want to be with you. You're my wife. And so that that's a big statement um, to let me know, hey, I'm I'm in this because I want a connection with you. And I think prior to that, didn't really realize the connection that he felt through our sexual encounters. Um, it had it had felt um, you know, more more one sided, more of a just to get a job done. Yeah. More functional. Yeah. So, so it was a good statement to let me know 
what it is that he really wants out of the relationship. And, and so that was, that was an amazing thing. And then, you know, after that, I'm assuming it was after that. I don't remember exact timelines. Um, that made it more clear and easy in the future when he saw that I was checked out, Hey, it looks like you're checked out. And I can clearly tell him, yeah, but I can get into this. Right. And so that gave it, that opened the door for more opportunities for us to figure out how to connect and then get the mind back reengaged again in future times. And how do you have a particular way that you learned to stay present during sex, Pam? Because knowing that Corey wants connection and wants it to be pleasurable for both of you is definitely not enough for a woman to be present during sex. It's it's required, but it's not enough. Agreed. Agreed. No, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of self-talk for me. It's a, a lot of, um, remembering in my head, okay, I can get there. And remembering how much I've when you say I can get there, do you mean I can get there to have an orgasm or you mean I can get there to be present? I would say both. I would say both. Okay. Um, Because those are two different orientations. But but when I get there and engage to have that connection, majority of the time it goes on to the not always, but majority of the time when the mind gets engaged it's there. I I agree. It's just that in my experience and in my experience coaching other couples, particularly women, if they're too goal oriented, that can slow down what's possible, which is where my question came from. Like, I think it's important to focus on being present and then on the orgasm rather than focusing on being present in order to have an orgasm that ends up not being as efficient. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The orgasm is the beautiful um, result of taking the time to connect. Yes. Of taking the time to, to say, I can get my head in the game. Yes. Give me a second. And here's how I'm going to, here's how we're going to guide this together uh, to make it work. And, and some of that would just come from talking. Yeah, that's usually what it was. Like she, she would just speak up, or I, I do too sometimes. Like, mm-hmm. hey, hold on, let's. I want to do. I'm not there. I got distracted or something that, that just throws anybody off because that's human. You know, that's that's the experience. Our bodies don't work always the way we want, nor does the mind or emotions. And so, just us learning to be able to speak up, her being able to speak up, um, was a huge shift too. Of just start talking about. Wait, no, I'm not there. Give me a moment. Can we try this? Or let's back up. Or Rain check, or I mean, just because it's a negotiation in some regards, all the way through. And we like to think that married sex is a long game, that it may not happen right now, but whatever, the next time could be fantastic. And that's good because we're building a whole scene here. It's not just one time. Yeah, I love that. And you point to like another flavor of the importance of talking about sex. Like we both know that one of the best positive predictors of a long lasting happy marriage is being able to talk about sex with your spouse. And most of the time I'm really encouraging people to talk about it when they're not having sex, if it's an unfamiliar conversation. Mm -hmm. But if it's a comfortable conversation, then there is something so glorious about being able to speak frankly during sex. I just don't think it's a starting point, but as advanced players, it's just beautiful to hear you talk about how that works for the two of you. Yeah. It was, it was not well done in the early stages of us either. I mean, it was always, it was defensive and reactive and, and overreactive and hurt feelings and pouty and angry. I mean, it was all of that when we talked about it during or right after, because most everybody's experience like ours was you talk about sex after something's gone wrong that's when you actually sit down to talk about it. And you're not in any state to talk about it at that point. So totally. And actually when I guide people to talk about sex, I encourage them to start with 
what felt wonderful, what went well, even if it's not the most recent encounter, to just remind yourselves you're on the same team, that you both want to be having great sex, and to not feel defensive. It's so helpful to remember a lovely time together in order to get into whatever needs to be addressed. Okay, well, Sexy Marriage Radio feels just like this conversation to me. But why don't you say a little bit about it yourself so that people know what to click on in order to go further with the kind of disarming, genuine way that the two of you address pretty much any topic in marriage? Well, that's about it. I mean, we we cover, the, what, what do we say? Uh, honest, straightforward conversations. No topic is off limits. Um, we'll give value-based, you know, healthy, health-based <laughs> information. Um, and then where we've landed lately is we like to think of ourselves as we try to help frame conversations for couples when it comes to their sex lives and in just life in general. Because when I can frame it well, I can find answers and solutions. Will you say what you mean by frame? I feel like I know, but it can be subtle. What What is well, meant by that? Some of, it, some of it comes back to like our conversation we've had today of just the idea of why won't she ever engage in sex well that's a bad framing if i'm if that's the question i'm asking myself because I, I would usually then bring this to her in that manner well why don't you like you and the to- only thing left to do is be defensive right a lot or a little she's immediately defensive to that yeah. because she's being accused of something even if there's factual evidence in there it's still whenever we get accused we react and so yeah. when i frame it different in the sense of wait what could be my culpability in this? What's my responsibility of showing up and preventing, presenting something inviting to have sex with? Am I someone that is worth having sex with? Right. And do I present something that's of value like that? You know, so it's just, if I frame it that way, now all of a sudden I could come at her on that same scenario we described earlier and say, you know what? Look, I realize I played a part in you being willing to check out and I want to own my side of it. That's a whole different framework of because I want a great marriage and great sex with you. And what can I do to help you? And let me tell you what I'm learning about me. And let's have some dialogue about it and we can get there together. You know, in this part of the conversation, I'm picturing my many trips to a frame store where, you know, like I'm going in with my photograph or my piece of art. And there are so many of those like corner long corner pieces that you can put beside it and you know if you put a neon green one down next to my i don't know family photo it just makes us all look like we're about to barf or you know you put an elegant simple silver one or maybe a carved wooden one but the point is that in choosing that frame it completely influences how that image is going to be experienced when it's up on the wall as well as what color the wall is and what the lighting is and so i think there's something freeing in talking about framing the way you have that you know this isn't about not bringing the content you genuinely want to share it's about framing it so you actually get some result that's appealing to you Well, and it's also about focusing on what you're responsible for, which is just yourself that most of the time. And you're responsible to frame it so that what you're bringing is pleasant to look at or hear. Fair. fair. But most of the time, like from what we discussed earlier of the idea of I can take the victim stance and now I just totally lost all my power of, well, you did this, you did that. Well, that's a totally, you know, no... There's no power to that stance, but if I can look at it as wait, when I, when I focus on my circle of what I'm responsible for, I have a greater likelihood of really influencing something better. I may not, but I have a better opportunity to do so. That's right. And if you don't, then you get to look for a better frame. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Okay. This has been so lovely speaking with the two of you. And I have to say that I just think that across the board, One of the reasons that marriages suffer is because there's a lack of honest, frank conversation, especially among 
committed couples who have mature, good marriages. And a good marriage, of course, includes navigating things and challenges, but also a kind of through line that is growth oriented. And I just think the world would be so different if there were more conversations like the one we've just had, which isn't mm -hmm. dramatic. It isn't, it isn't really full of revelations, but it is fundamentally an expression of a paradigm of how to be with somebody else in life for a really long time that is rich and nourishing and passionate and sexy. So I'm so grateful that the two of you have these conversations regularly and that you've had this conversation with me. Any last words, Corey? No, this has been great. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. What about you, Pam? I, I just appreciate what you're doing, helping spread the word and, and um, helping people have these conversations yourself. So thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and please leave a rating and a review. And if you're ready to deepen your relationship and create a truly intimate, delicious, and vibrant marriage, head over to the Work With Me page at alexandrastockwell.com and choose the program that's right for you.